name is Del Spoonmore, and I'm going to be talking about how to start growing food. So I'm going to be using my phone to drive this presentation uh, because we have an app. So if you search for From Seed to Spoon in the App Store, you'll find our app. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about what our app does because it really relates to growing food. Then we're going to be using it for the presentation. So um, I'm going to start by showing you my garden. So this is kind of where our journey started. Um, in 2015, I'd never grown anything in my life, um, but I, I'm, 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 on, I'm on the spectrum and, and I got obsessed and this kind of became my thing. And I'm, I'm in software development, so I wanted to make an app to make it easy for other people to do what we had done. So that's what this app is for, is to help you do this or just grow something small if you want. It's for, for all sizes of gardeners. So what it does is it gives you a list of over 100 plants to choose from. Um, if you're overwhelmed by the number, you can actually filter the plants list by their health benefits. So if you look for brain and memory, this will show you all the plants that help with brain and memory. So if you're just starting out, this kind of gives you a framework of, of what to start with. Um, once you choose on a plant that you want to grow, it will show you planting dates that are calculated based on the nearest growing uh, weather station to you. Uh, before I get too much farther, by the way, if you don't have a ticket, raise your hand, we'll give you a ticket. We're giving away a bunch of smart pots at the end of this uh, talk, so make sure you get a ticket to win that. So it gives you planting dates that are calculated based on where you live for the spring, summer, and fall. Uh, it shows you all the different information, and we'll get into what all this means here in a second once we start talking about plants, but uh, let's go ahead and start there. So if you want to start growing food, let's kind of start by talking about the basics of, of what you do to get started. So if you already have a raised bed or an in-ground garden, then, then that's great. Start with that. But if you don't and you're starting out new, uh, I really recommend something like this. So these are smart pots. They're made here in Oklahoma City. Uh, they're fabric raised beds. And these were kind of a game changer for us because before we got these, we were doing raised beds in the ground, which are great, but have some disadvantages. So once you build that raised bed, it's not gonna move, right? Well, it's easy to move these around. Um, also, these do a lot better job with water management than, uh, than the, the other raised beds. Um, we, we've, uh, another thing about them, is that uh, they take in air from the sides as well. So with your raised beds, the plants are only able to get oxygen from above. Plants that grow in these are able to get oxygen from the side and from above. Um, also, when the roots hit the bottom, they continue to grow down through the fabric into the ground and pour, uh, pull moisture up. So another thing you can do about them as well is in the summer, you can put them inside of a, like a kiddie pool or something like that and like put like two inches of water in there and they'll be sub-irrigated so they'll, be, they'll drink water from below. So I'm not getting paid from them or anything like that. I'm just a big believer in these products. Uh, if I were starting all over, I would probably only do these. Uh, we've got a bunch of videos and stuff on YouTube that show you how we grow in our backyard. So if you wanna see all of that, you can go check it out. Uh, from our app, we have a, a videos tab here that pulls in all the videos from our YouTube channel. It better work. It better not not work on me while I'm up here. It's not even nice. There we go, okay. Well, you can see the most popular ones right now. So anyway, um, so you can see all the YouTube channels we have from our backyard that show all this kind of stuff. So, so once you've decided on what you wanna grow in, if it's a smart pot, a container, uh, it doesn't really matter at this point. So um, the next step is, is soil, which is the most important part out of all of it. You can buy bag soil mix from the store. Uh, I do recommend getting the soil mix that has the little white particles in it. Uh, vermiculite or perlite because it really helps with, with moisture management. It's going to get expensive though if you're buying soil mix from the store, especially if you're trying to grow at the scale that we are. So we make it all ourselves and it's really easy to make. Um, we have a blog post that goes into detail on this on our website, but I'm going to kind of just go through the basics of it. You combine three different ingredients together. The first one is vermiculite. You can buy it in bulk from nurseries all around. Don't go to like a Home Depot or wherever and buy it, it's way overpriced there. At nurseries, it's, way, it's a lot cheaper. You can buy it in bulk. So it's like $30 for a really big bag that'll make you a lot. Um, that's the first ingredient. The second ingredient is coconut core. You can substitute peat moss for this instead, but I really like coconut core because the, it has these fibers and stuff in it and it really helps with uh, getting the soil to have a little better aeration and, and structure in it. So that's the second ingredient. We buy that in bulk. Um, we buy it online actually. We have links in the app to all these products I'm talking about. So this, this right here, this um, coconut core concentrated seed starting mix, we use this for all of our seed starting and then they have a larger version of coconut core that comes in bigger bricks that we use for the outside stuff. So that's the second step, the second ingredient. And then the third ingredient that you mix into this is compost. 
So it's really best to get compost from a variety of sources. So don't just go to one place and get compost. Try and get from a multitude of places. And the reason for that is this. Uh, compost is the food for the plants. If the, if the plants eat the exact same thing every day, you know, just like humans, that you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to have a variety of, of nutrients in your diet. So if you have compost from a uh, cow source, compost from a vegetable source, compost from rabbits, compost from worms, and all these different sources, and you mix them together, now you've got a really well-balanced diet for your plants, if you will, which will make your life a lot easier because if you have good soil life and you have good soil, that's gonna feed the plants for you. You don't have to do near as much fertilizer or near as much work or pest management or any of that if the plants are healthy. So soil is the most important thing. Um, if you're looking for where to get compost from, Minic Materials here in the city has really good stuff. They have three, sometimes four different types of compost. So you can get like, I'll go and get like a third of a scoop of each and have them dump in the back of my truck. So that gives me three there. I've got a rabbit that produces a bunch of manure. That gives us four. We've got worm bins, there's five. And we also have a standard compost pile. So it's not hard to get these mixes of compost. Um, we can do it just from going to one place and then making the rest on our own. So once you get those three, you mix them together. The easiest way I found to mix them together, uh, you know those compost tumblers you see at like Sam's Club or Walmart, they like stand up in the air? They are terrible for compost, but they are great for making soil mix because you can dump like a barrel, a, I mean, a bucket of each into that mixer and then spin it around and it mixes it for you. I've also mi like mixed it on a tarp and stuff. That works, it just takes a little bit longer. I really like those compost tumblers for that. And so many people buy those tumblers, find out they don't work very well and then put them on the side of the curb or sell them on Craigslist. So you can get like a really good deal on it pretty much any time you go look on Craigslist or something, you could find those. Um, okay, so that covers the containers and the soil. And from here on, the app is gonna guide you through what to do next. So let's start talking about growing food. And let's start talking about first by like what we can, we're gonna go like kind of chronologically through the year, starting with like what you can do now. And then I'm just gonna keep talking until I run out of time. So starting now, we are doing some stuff indoors. So we actually have a filter in here where you can filter by can be planted. This shows you all the things that you can do now. So these are the things that you can start indoors now. And really you could try and push some stuff outdoors now. If you throw some spinach or kale seeds out there right now, there's a good chance that you're gonna get kale here in a few months from it. Now, if we get a wicked cold come through here in like three weeks and it kills off the sprouts, you may have to get going again, but the, the seeds are so cheap, just try again. So that's what we're doing from here until really the beginning of, of April. And that's maybe middle March is we're throwing kale, lettuce and spinach seeds everywhere we can. And we're doing that about every week. So we're, we're planting new rounds of it in different places. Um, just trying to gamble on getting stuff early. Now we do have spinach that we started last year. So let's kind of start by talking about that because we do have stuff in our garden already that survived over the winter. So spinach and kale survived the winter here in Oklahoma without any protection or anything. You just got to water them through the winter and they do great. And they're really coming back alive now. So they'll probably get stunted again here once we're going to get another cold. It happens every year in, in Oklahoma where we get walled in February once we get cozy. Um, that's going to happen again. Um, but then things are going to bounce back. So um, you notice, like I've talked about greens. Greens are, are pretty commonly grown in, in the cool season. So greens don't really like the heat. They like the cool season of the spring and of the, the fall. So I'm going to do my filters now to cool season so we can see what's coming up. Because the only stuff that's on the list for can be planted right now is stuff that's indoors. So let's kind of look at what we're, what we're looking at for coming up. So we've talked about spinach, kale. I'm going to go into detail on spinach a little bit because it is my favorite thing to grow. Um, it's one of the easiest things to grow, and it also has a ton of nutrients in it for you. So uh, I started growing food to help with anxiety and depression. That was kind of the reason why we started. I've dealt with it my entire life, and the book called The Depression Cure talked about how I could help manage it through food, water, exercise, you know, mindfulness, all these things we've learned since we were kids. And something about the way the book explained it made me buy into it. And we started growing food, and then after a few weeks, we're spending a lot of money on spinach and kale. So that's kind of where we started. So I started with spinach, and the first time I tasted spinach out of the garden, it was like this lightning moment for me. Because before that, I, I do a spinach as the stuff that Popeye ate, and stuff that was in a can that was in my pantry that we never, I mean, I thought maybe it was one of those things we hid stuff in. I didn't know if it was real. That was my relationship with spinach. Oh, and I started to get it on like Subway sandwiches in like, like mid-20s, so I could feel like I was doing something. But that was really all I knew about spinach. And once I tasted it out of the garden, things changed because it is so good. It has like a completely different taste to it, and it's cool and crisp, 
and every variety tastes different. And that was kind of the hook for me because my OCD thought, well, I want to try them all. And that's kind of how I ended up where I am today. So um, I, I love growing spinach. It's really easy to grow. You just throw seeds out, and that's all there really is to it. Um, the app has these different sections. Let's talk through what these mean now. So every plant has different seasons it likes to grow in, cool or warm. So this kind of gives you a breakdown of that. The number per square. So let's talk about what this means. Square foot gardening is one of the first concepts that uh, I learned about when I started gardening. There's a book called Square Foot Gardening uh, that, that goes into detail about this, but it's really simple. The basic idea is this. You have, um, you take your garden bed and you divide it into square feet, okay? And then every square can be planted independently of the square next to it and has its own numbers for how many per square it is, right? So with spinach, it's nine per square, which is nine seeds per square. Um, they have a really cool device out there called the seeding square right here that makes this whole template thing easy because if you're like me and you like things to be perfectly like I really like this thing for that um, but that's the basic idea behind square foot gardening and, and, it, and it helps a number of things first of all it makes it easier if you have a bed you can try all these different things and it doesn't feel as overwhelming but just that idea of trying different things in a bed helps you grow food better and the reason for that is that it's called companion planting so when you have a whole bed of like one thing there's a bunch of tomatoes it's really easy for the tomato hornworm and all the other pests that like tomatoes to find the tomato plant because they're using their sense of smell to find it. So there's a giant bed of tomatoes. Great dinner, right? But if you have a bed that has a tomato in the middle and you have basil here and oregano and rosemary and sage and you have onions on the outside and you've got all these different things everywhere, now the pests get confused. And they might find one of your tomatoes, but they're not gonna find all of them, right? Because they have all these different scents in the air they're trying to figure out. They're gonna move on to your neighbor that has all of them next to each other. So that's the basic idea behind companion planting. Uh, there's other aspects of it too. Like basil makes tomatoes taste better. This has been proven. Like they grow really well next to each other. And there's a lot of other companions. So that's where this friends tab comes into play. So this shows you all the plants that grow well next to spinach and this tab tells you what to avoid. Spinach is pretty friendly with everything but, but potatoes. So it's easy to keep track of with spinach, but for other plants, it's harder. So that's the purpose of this friends tab is to make it easy for y'all to know what to plant next to each other. So go down the list, container size. This is the, uh, if you're gonna grow in a container, this is the, like, the smallest size you wanna go with for that thing. Um, the time to harvest, this is how long it's gonna take to, to harvest once you plant it. Now we have a new version of the app called Garden Plus that is in testing right now. Uh, if you'd like to test it, email us. Um, but this is coming out uh, in the spring and this is going to make it to where you don't have to keep track of anything. It keeps track of everything for you. So whenever you plant something, you mark, I planted this, and then it will tell you when it's estimated to harvest. So all this data will start you know, working for you to send you push notifications saying, hey, it's time to go. It's, uh, it'll do ha notifications for when it's supposed to sprout, when you're supposed to water, like all these things, it's gonna walk you through so you don't have to worry about knowing when to do what. So we've been working, Patrick, me, Justin, I think might be around here somewhere. We've been working all year on this um, and we are so excited to get it out for y'all. So we would love for people to test it. Uh, let us know what you think. Um, we also have sun requirements here. So every plant likes different amounts of sun. So um, spinach likes full sun when it's in the spring, but when it gets in the summer, it likes part shade. So this is kind of what that means. There's a scale from full sun to, to full shade and plants fall within that somewhere. So that, that's what this is meant for. Uh, watering, every plant has different amounts of water it likes to receive. So spinach likes a lot of water, but other plants like squash are gonna have issues if you water it too much. So it's important to know how much watering that plant needs. Again, Garden Plus is gonna make this easy because it's gonna tell you when to water. So um, fertilizing, uh, same thing. Every plant has different amounts of fertilizer, different types of fertilizer it likes. Uh, spinach and other greens like nitrogen applied pretty regularly, like once a month. Uh, we use fish fertilizer for, we use all organic fertilizers, first of all, uh, but fish fertilizer is our favorite source for quick release nitrogen. If we want a slow release nitrogen, we do blood meal. Uh, if we want phosphorus, we'll do bone meal. Uh, potassium is the same. Um, so we're using organic stuff for all of this. If you're curious what blood meal or bone meal is, it's blood or bone from a cow that's been dried up. So it's all just organic ingredients. Um, there's all sorts of organic fertilizers out there. Again, we have links to all the different ones in the app of, of ones that we use. Um, 
but we're not using any chemical fertilizers. And I just want to talk briefly about why and what the logic is there. Because when I first started gardening, I was not beholden to being an organic gardener. I, I, I do believe in the ideas of it, but I'm, I wasn't religious about it. Um, and it wasn't until I started growing food that I saw why organic gardening works better, in my opinion, than chemical gardening. And the reason for that is this. The, um, the soil life is what actually feeds your plants. So whenever you put down organic fertilizers in your garden, the soil life takes up those nutrients, attaches to the roots of the plant, and feeds the plants for you from those nutrients. So if you have that soil life going, it's doing the work for you, and it's a lot easier. Now, once you start to put down chemical fertilizer, there's so much salt in those chemicals that it's gonna to start to kill off the soil life. Now you're on the hook for keeping, the, for keeping all the nutrients going. So you're having to like, you have enough this, you have enough that, you're, like, you're, you're stressed out about it all the time, right? Um, but if you're growing organically, you don't have to worry about any of that. The soil does it for you, keep putting compost down, keep putting down organic sources of nutrients, and the thing just works. I mean, go look at the forest. No one's fertilizing that, but there's plants everywhere, right? They've sold us this idea that you gotta buy all these fertilizers. That's just marketing, y'all. You don't have to worry about any of that. Uh, we only buy fish fertilizer because I don't wanna go catch a bunch of fish and run them through a blender. I tried it once and it was gross. I'm not doing it again. So I buy fish fertilizer. <laughs> I get obsessed, y'all. I like to get into the details of everything. So, um, okay, so let's keep going down the list of what we have here. The outdoor planting method. Uh, every plant is different. Some plants do not like to be transplanted. Carrots, beets, anything that grows a root, do not transplant it. It's gonna be mad. It's not gonna grow a root. Um, but, you know, spinach does okay as a transplant, but really it's best grown by seed. So in here, you'll see, you'll see seed or transplant. A lot of times, things like tomatoes and peppers are often transplanted because it takes so long to get them going that if you were to start it from seed in Oklahoma in April when you can do it, then, you're, then by the time it gets big enough to produce in the summer, it's too hot, so it's not gonna produce tomatoes. And you're not gonna have tomatoes until August or September whenever the heat goes down. So if you start tomatoes or peppers indoors or buy them from a, a nursery and then, tra and then transplant them out in, you know, in April when it's time, they're already a decent size. There's a chance you get tomatoes before the heat comes, because tomatoes don't produce once it gets over about 90, 95, the flowers just drop. That's pretty much all plants that produce fruit like that. So, um, so that's the idea of why you would transplant in tomatoes or peppers. Uh, we have the seed depth, so this is how far down you plant the seed if you're planting out, how many days it takes to sprout. Again, Garden Plus is gonna make this easy because it's gonna tell you when to, when to look for it to sprout. Um, the height, this matters because you don't want things to be covered by the sun. So you want to put your tallest stuff on the north side. Uh, we have some really cool stuff coming down the line that lets you like draw out your garden and place things. This is really going to come in then because we're going to help you avoid mistakes of planting things on the wrong side. And then family, this is important because again, the companion planting thing I talked about, you really want to try and have like different families of plants embedded in a bed. If you have a plant that's all the same family, well, those families have the same pests and the same diseases generally. So you want to avoid having everything in the same family. Again, this is where the companion uh, tab makes it easy because we have the, the data for you. But if you want to see the family, you can there. And then, did you, did you want to hand these out throughout the show? Or yeah, by the way, if you've sat down or you don't have a ticket, raise your hand. Patrick will go around and give you a ticket. We're giving out free smart pots. Do that throughout the show, though, yeah, just keep, well, we're going to give out the smart pots at the end. At the end. But yeah. OK, so we have um, harvesting information here. Um, some, it's pretty easy to harvest. This is the easiest part, right? Just go out there and you grab it. But uh, different plants kind of have different uh, requirements sometimes. So um, about when you should harvest, like watermelon is a big one, where if you harvest it too early, you've just got a, not uh, something that doesn't taste great. <laughs> you know, it takes a while to sweeten up. So it has different information about that. Uh, cooking and eating. Um, we have a ton of recipes from our garden. So we have a recipes tab here that shows you all the recipes that come in. Uh, we also have a blog that we run that uh, has a, t we put out, we're putting out a blog post almost every other day about, I mean, you can see all the different so type of stuff we have, but this is all related to spinach in some way, shape, or form. Uh, and then also videos. So we, these are all the videos that are related to spinach. Um, okay, so let's go back to the main tab. Uh, saving seeds. So this is kind of the last step. If you're in a, this, uh, the seed saving, we have that information as well. Uh, we don't do a lot of seed saving because it's so much easier to go pin, spend like $2 on a packet of seeds and to, to try and, but if, if we do have like a variety of something that we like a lot or something like that, then we'll, we'll go ahead and save seeds on it. Okay, so now let's talk about this types tab. So there's a lot of different varieties of each plant. 
Uh, we have a partnership with Burpee where we pull in all of their varieties, and you can see that here. Um, for some plants, we have filters set up. There's not enough for spinach to really require filters, but for tomatoes, there's like 150 types of tomatoes they have, so we've made it easy to filter down to the ones you want by just you know, looking for, share, for, for cherry or, or, or vine or, or anything like that. Um, we have a pest tab, so this shows you the pests that attack each plant. And if you tap on the pest, it shows you how we handle it organically. Um, it's not always through spraying stuff. For aphids, we're buying ladybugs on Amazon. We haven't had to because we bought them the first year and they've set up shop and they come back every year. But if you, especially if you're in a greenhouse or something like that, that's a great way to manage aphids is to buy ladybugs and release them because they eat a ton of lady, they, t they eat a ton of aphids. One tip there is ladybugs only fly when the sun is out. So if you release them in the morning, a lot of them are going to fly away. <laughs> and you can watch your money fly away. But if you release them at night and they've got a source of food, which is aphids, and a source of water, they're going to set up shop and they're going to do their thing. And you're, you're going to see babies really soon. And the babies eat way more than the adults. Now, I will kind of give you a heads up because the first time I saw a ladybug baby in my garden, I was like, what is this thing? See this right here? That's a good, that's good. So if you see that in your garden, it's a ladybug baby. It looks like a little cat, like a little alligator, a little black and orange alligator. Um, these things eat way more aphids than the adults. If you see those, leave them alone. So those are, those are good bugs. And that's, that's the purpose of this beneficials tab is because when we first started gardening, um, you know, every single new bug I came across is like, what is this thing? And I'm emailing the Cleveland County Extension. There's an expert that used to be down named Tracy that is kind of this bug database in her head. And I'm emailing her every other day, you know. And so that was the idea of getting all that information into one place where you can look at pictures, easily identify what it is you're dealing with, and then learn how to, how to manage it from there. And there's a ton, like I said, there's a ton of really good bugs for your garden. If you just spray pesticide everywhere, again, you're taking the ownership of your garden into your hands, and now you're on the hook for keeping track of who's good and who's bad, right? Um, because you're gonna kill the good bugs and the bad bugs. But if you uh, buy praying mantises on Amazon, again, <laughs> importing more things to help, um, or if you uh, encourage spiders, don't be scared of spiders, like be happy they're around. Like we have orb weavers everywhere and there are pets. We had like 18 of them last year set up everywhere because they catch so many bugs. Um, and it, so, it's, so it's really just embracing this ecosystem that's already there that you just got to help the good guys a little bit. And then, you know, if you see aphids, spray them off every now and stuff like that. But really try to, I try and take a hands-off approach when it comes to pests and just trust the good guys are going to win. Now, what comes with squash bugs, those things are evil and that's just a, a different story altogether. They're very difficult to manage. You got to get ahead of them. Um, we'll talk about squash bugs here in a minute once we get into squash. Okay, so now that we've talked through kind of how this app works for each plant, let's kind of go through the list and keep talking about what all you can grow. So um, aside from greens, in the cool season, you can also grow root crops. So carrots, beets, um, you know, parsnips, turnips, all that, all that kind of stuff. Uh, radish as well. By the way, we have free radish and lettuce seeds over at our booth. As soon as we're done here, just meet me over there and you're welcome to get whatever you like. Um, so carrots are easy to grow but they take a little bit of work in the beginning because it takes like 21 days for the seed to sprout for a carrot when it's cold and the seed has to stay pretty moist the entire time. So if you plant your seeds, water it once and forget about it, you may not have much luck if it doesn't rain. So you've got to really do some things to help spinach out, I mean to help carrots out. So we're doing, uh, if we're planting, we're really not planting them till about mid-February you know, around Valentine's Day is when we're first trying to get stuff out, depending on the weather. I mean, if we've got a big ice storm coming in, obviously we're not, but if it works out to where the weather's gonna be nice, we're getting that first round in, we're covering it with some light straw, you know, we're trying to keep it insulated with, uh, with burlap. Burlap helps a lot too, because it keeps the sun off of it so the, moist, the seeds can stay moist longer. Um, carrots are 16 per square, so this is where that seeding square is really handy, because the seeds are tiny, so if you lay that thing out, it's just, you know, one every, um, there's you know, one every four, there's four rows. Um, it's a really great thing for our kids to do too. We taught our three and four year old like their colors and counting and all that through that device. Um, okay, so trying to think if there's anything else I want to talk about with carrots. By the way, if you have any questions, feel free to just raise your hand. We can answer those as we go. Um, the next family or kind of category of plants that can be started in the spring easily um, are herbs. 
So you don't necessarily start them from seed in the spring. Uh, some of them you could. I mean, cilantro you get going in the spring, but um, when I'm talking herbs, I'm talking like rosemary, sage, oregano, these kind of kitchen staples. Those are often transplanted because it takes a long time to get them to a decent size, especially rosemary. Like it takes a couple years to get one of these size. So I'm typically buying those. My favorite source for, for plants, especially for herbs, is Prairie Wind Nursery. Uh, Bill Ferris, is, uh, he has a nursery down in Norman. He's also at the farmer's markets a lot. I think he's gonna be at the Scissor Tail Farmer's Market. Um, he carries a lot of variety. So when I first started out and I was looking for basil or rosemary, there were the exact same varieties everywhere I went. And I thought that was just how it was. And then when I saw, saw his place for the first time, it opened my eyes because he has like 14 types of, of basil and 10 different types of rosemary and all these different varieties. And it, it makes it really nice because when you're, when you're starting out with growing food and you have all these ideas of growing a bunch of food, it's well and great for like two or three weeks and you're all excited about it. But then you're going to get really tired of squash or whatever it is you're getting if it tastes the same way every time. And that's where herbs really come in because you can switch up the flavor of a meal you know, tremendously from one to the next just by throwing a different herb in there. So if you have squash and you have basil and you have squash and you have oregano, it tastes completely different. We also make a lot of curry. I mean, I'm sorry, not curry, pesto. We do make curry as well, but we make a lot of pesto from herbs. Uh, sage pesto is my favorite. So just sage leaves, a uh, quick pesto recipe. Again, we have a guide on our website and videos and all of that, but it's really simple. You just take a bunch of leaves, like two handfuls, and then you do some pine nuts, some uh, Parmesan cheese, some olive oil, and some garlic, and just mix it together in a blender. And that's all there is to it. Yes? A good time to plant fennel. So I am not a big fan of fennel. Let me look it up in the app, actually. I don't know that one. Uh, OK. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a cool season crop. The reason why I don't really like fennel is because fennel um, is, a, is a bad companion to pretty much everything. So I can't have it like. <laughs> You know, if I'm gonna grow fennel, it has to be like by itself. Um, so I haven't really grown it that much yet. Also, I haven't found a great way to eat it. Once I find that, generally I start growing a lot of it. So I just gotta get to know fennel a little better, honestly, I think. Because sage was the same way. Like for three years, I did not like sage at all. And I had it because the flower smelled good and it grew really big and made me feel like a good gardener. Um, but then once I started making sage pesto, I was like, this is good. And the nice thing about that stuff too is that your body recognizes it's good too. So once you eat it like two or three times, your body's like, hey, go get some of that sage pesto. Yeah, because it, it knows how much you know, good stuff it has, has for you in it. Talked about herbs. Uh, the reason why now is a good time to start getting them transplanted out is because if you plant them too late in the spring and they don't have enough time to get settled before the heat comes in, that can kill them in a hurry. So when you plant them out you know, in February, they get plenty of time to get their roots established until the heat of summer comes in. Um, Another thing that you can plant now with kind of the same idea, fruit trees and fruit bushes. So blackberries are the easiest thing to grow in Oklahoma. They grow natively here. They, they're wild in a lot of places. So they're really easy to grow. In fact, they will start to take over an area if they're not controlled. Uh, you can find thornless blackberries as well. Um, so if you've got kids, you know, that's, we've got those. Uh, the majority of our blackberries are thornless. Um, blueberries require a little different soil pH so they're not hard to grow. You just got to adjust the soil a little bit. Um, it's one of the only things you really have to worry about doing that with as far as pH. Um, so for that reason, I, it's a lot easier to grow blueberries inside of a big smart pot because you only have to adjust the soil in that one small area. If you're trying to adjust the soil in like a raised bed, well now you're fighting the fact that Oklahoma likes a high pH. So every time it rains, it's changing, you know, it's, so you're, it's this constant struggle. So if you do a big, like 25, 20 gallon smart pot, and they have handles too, so you can carry them around, or put them on a dolly, I'll do that sometimes too. But that makes it a lot easier to grow blueberries. Um, raspberries are also really grow in Oklahoma, easy to grow in Oklahoma. Raspberries and blackberries just do in the ground. They love it here, they're gonna do fine. I wouldn't worry about putting them in a smart pot. Question. Your question, yes. When the app shows the pot size, uh -huh. for a Yes, when it shows the pot size, well, I say it's for a single plant, but for spinach, it's not. It's for a single square foot, basically. So you can follow the square foot gardening sizes for the smart pots too, for the container. So I think for spinach, it says seven gallon smart pot, I would still do. Now for spinach, I would do, for pretty much, for all those greens and things like that, I'm doing a, a wider smart pot, like a 100 gallon smart pot that's only about a foot tall, so I can get a wide area of it. And then I'm saving the 20 gallons, the 10 gallons, stuff like that for tomatoes, peppers, watermelon, things that are more individual in nature. 
right? So that's how I'm, that's how I'm grouping my smart pots together. And I'll also have like a, I have a hundred gallon smart pot. I have a collection of three that's my herb garden. So I've got like one of each herb, you know, right there, right next off the kitchen where we first walk in the garden. So it's easy to harvest for dinner. So the nice thing about the smart pots too is you can have like different themed gardens. If you have like a salsa garden, Kevin, like a strawberry garden, a fruit garden, all these different themes that makes it easy too. Um, okay, so we've talked about fruits. Um, okay, so the next thing we can talk about for getting started in the spring is peas. And let's talk about peas for a second because I kind of have this whole strategy I use that, that revolves around peas, beans, and southern peas. So let's kind of talk through it. Um, we start off growing peas. That's the first legume that we're growing. Uh, so these are all members of the, of the legume family. Bees, uh, peas, beans, southern peas are all members of the same family. And they have a couple of unique qualities. Mainly, they produce their own nitrogen. So members, members of the legume family are able to take nitrogen out of the air and store it down in the soil in these little modules. So that's great for your other plants that are around them, especially ones that come after them. So we're doing a lot of planting peas along a fence that we know that a heavy feeder is going to be coming after it. So like cucumber, for example, right? I'll plant peas along the fence first, knowing that cucumber's coming in the spring. So um, we love growing peas. They're really easy to grow. We pretty much only grow the, the vining varieties and we'll plant it along some sort of fence. Um, the cheapest way we found to make fences is to get cattle panels um, or like the hardware remesh panels. So the hardware remesh panels are like $8 at Home Depot. They're four by eight and they're just that like remesh material, right? Um, those work great. Uh, we attach those to T-posts. T-posts we generally just find on the side of the road whenever it's a big trash day. There's always, they're, they're everywhere. Um, so I've got a stash of a bunch in my backyard. I just, every time I see one, I pull over and grab them. Um, and then we also have the cattle panels and we've done those two different ways. So we have, they're, they're 14 feet long and they're $18 at Tractor Supply. So we'll have one that like we just leave standing up straight and it's like a longer one. But then we also arch them over and put two next to each other. So it's like a hoop house without the hoop without the, the plastic over it and we'll grow several things on them so we'll grow beans on them and they grow all the way over and hang down uh, we grow loofah on those which if you didn't know you can grow loofah the thing you use in your kitchen it's a it's a squash plant you grow it and then let it dry you peel it and that's that's a loofah it's pretty awesome and they produce a ton i mean one seed is going to produce i don't think i'm exaggerating when i say you can get 100 off of it uh, it's crazy how much you, how much you get off of one plant especially if it's got room to grow um, we're also growing small watermelons that way. So you have watermelons hanging down off this. Uh, if you grow the bigger watermelons, you have to like give them some support to keep them from, from snapping off. So we stick to the small, the small watermelons. Cantaloupes, kind of the same way. Uh, kiwi, you can grow kiwi in Oklahoma the same way as well. Um, if there's anything that, that vines, we're trying to get it on a fence. And th this concept is called vertical gardening because you really maximize your space. If you have vining plants that vine all out the ground, that's all growing space you can't use, but if you train them to go up, now you're, you're being more efficient with your space. So again, check out our YouTube channel because we show all this stuff. And we're about to be kicking up a lot more videos again showing everything we're doing in our garden. So, um, so let's talk about kind of about the overall strategy I mentioned a second ago. So we start with peas and that's in you know, February and we stop around March. And then starting in March, we start planting pole beans so there's a lot of different varieties of pole beans. We try and get as many different colors of beans as we can. So we mix in different colors into our diet. Um, but those grow the same as peas. So the idea is the same. And then once we hit around May, we switch to southern peas. So southern peas are black-eyed peas. Um, they're, they're in the bean family, but they're not necessarily the same. They're, they're a little bit different and they, and they love the heat. So they, they do really well in the summer here. So we have those going through the summer and then starting back in August, we'll go back to beans again. And then, in, and then really till the end of August, September early, we'll, be doing, we'll start peas. So then we kind of have this whole timeline where we have peas or beans the whole year, starting in, in February, just kind of about changing what we're growing the same way. So that's kind of our strategy for how we do all of that. Um, is there anything that someone really wants to hear about that I haven't talked about yet? I want to make sure I cover. Okra, yes, great, okay. So, oh, so we're pretty much getting into summer at this point, I think, so let's talk about like the, the summer crops. So the easiest things to grow in Oklahoma in the, in the summer, okra, hands down, is probably the easiest. It loves the heat, 
it thrives. You're gonna get a ton of okra off of it also. Make sure you harvest them when the okra is small because once they get too big, they're hard to, unless you're doing like a gumbo soup or something, they're, they're pretty inedible. Um, basil is also really, to grow, really easy to grow in Oklahoma here in the summer. We're starting most of our basil from seed, like 75% of it, we're just sprinkling seed everywhere. But I will go get a couple basil transplants early April when I plant my tomatoes so that I have like some basil early in the season. I'm, after, I'm not having to wait until May to get some basil, right? So, so we'll buy like three or four transplants in the spring, do a ton of seeds, and then by summer we've got basil everywhere. There's a lot of different varieties of basil as well. Um, so in here we've got all the different kinds. Um, but really the thing about, that's nice about basil is you can really change up the taste of a meal in the summer, night to night, just with different varieties. Um, our favorites are Thai basil. There's a lettuce leaf basil as well that makes like a really big leaf that's really mild, so you can put it on a sandwich. Um, here at two o'clock, I'm going into detail on herbs, exclusively herbs you can cook with, how to grow them, how to cook with them, right over there, like right under that 4300 sign at our booth. So uh, come on over for that if you'd like to hear more about, about herbs in particular. Um, yeah, does anyone have a ticket, by the way? We're giving away smart pots. At, I mean, if you don't have a ticket, raise your hand. We're giving out smart pots here uh, and pretty soon, like 15 minutes. So if you don't have a ticket, uh, raise your hand. We'll bring one over. Um, okay, let me look through the list. We didn't talk about broccoli yet. I'm going to come back to that because I think that's an important one. Um, this is another cool season crop. It's in the same family as kale, so it grows very similarly to them. When I first started growing broccoli, I only knew about the broccoli from the store that grew like these big tree looking things and that was broccoli to me, right? So I thought in order to grow broccoli, you've got to grow that thing, that's what broccoli is. And then the first year, we got hit with a massive hailstorm, like two months into the broccoli growing and all those heads got torn up and I was devastated. And I was going to, I was, I was in the Oklahoma Gardening Facebook group a lot back then. And I was posting in there about, you know, I was devastated my broccoli got torn up and someone told me, well, why don't you just eat the leaves, silly? I was like, what? And that changed everything for me. So once I learned that the entire broccoli plant is edible, that changed the way I grew broccoli. And I started growing different varieties. So they have bro uh, broccoli varieties that mature in like 50 days. And instead of producing one giant head, they produce a bunch of side, like smaller ones. That's pretty much all I grow now are these sprouting bro uh, broccoli types because you get so much more out of it um, you don't have to wait 90 days for this giant head to, to, to develop. You have to protect from hell storms and worms and all this other stuff. Um, and also, the way that I thought about bro planting broccoli started to change too. So broccoli is one of those one per square plants. And the first year I did that, I planted one little broccoli plant in this square and they had all this extra space around that plant that went wasted for like you know, six weeks until that broccoli plant blew, uh, grew up and took up that space. So what I do now is if I'm planting broccoli in a square, I will sprinkle seeds in the entire square. Maybe like, I'll end up with maybe 12 plant, maybe 12 seeds, 12 plants growing in that, in that square. And then I will just let the best one be the one that survives. So I'll, I'll thin them down as they continue to grow. Um, those thinnings are incredibly nutritious for you. Those are called microgreens. So if you've heard the microgreen term before, it's really simple. It's a kale or a broccoli or some other nutritious plant that only gets that big and then you harvest it. That's all microgreen is. Um, we also have microgreens in our house that we grow under grow lights where we'll sprinkle thousands of seeds on a 10 by 20 tray and they grow. I, I was gonna bring it up here today, I just forgot it. And they'll get about that big and then you cut them down and throw them in whatever you want. And that is a, a really easy way to get a ton of nutrients into your body because the basic idea is this. There's a lot of nutrition stored in that seed. That's how the seed makes a giant plant, right? So you get all the nutrition from that seed plus a couple rounds of photosynthesis which makes all new stuff that's good for you. So you get all of that in this tiny little package. Whereas if you grow bro broccoli all the way to full size, well now that initial nutrition that was in the seed is spread across the whole plant. So you're getting like a, a huge dose of, of all those chemicals that, that are in broccoli specifically that are really good for you in a small dose. So that's why I like to do microgreens. Um, cauliflower is the same as broccoli, by the way. So if you want to grow cauliflower, basically the same as broccoli. It's a little more finicky though. Um, so I, I don't grow a lot of cauliflower. Um, we haven't talked about squash yet. That's also something that does really well in the summer here. 
Uh, squash bugs are very difficult though. So that's the one thing about squash is you've got to monitor it. Um, if you go look at squash plants, let me go to squash bugs, you can see. Oh, I'm on beneficials. Okay. So if I go down to squash bugs, these little eggs here, you got to be checking the underside of your squash plant every day for those because once they get going, it is so hard to keep them under control. I mean, even if you did pesticide, it wouldn't kill them because they're like cockroaches. Once they have that hard shell around them, you're not going to kill them with the pesticide. So um, our strategy for squash is really trying to diversify. And what I mean by that is we're planting squash in a lot of different places. I'm not planting a lot of it together. This whole companion plant thing, right? So if, if a plant does get infected with squash bugs, I don't give it, I mean, honestly, I'm pretty ruthless. I will, um, I will not give that plant much time for it to fight it off. Once I see that it's not gonna fight them off, um, I, will give, I, I will let the squash bugs kind of come to that plant. And then once I see the eggs are starting, like, starting to hatch, I will cut that plant off, throw it all in a fire, and then like, douse that whole area with diatomaceous earth so um, diatomaceous earth is an organic uh, treatment for pests. It's, it's, this super, it's these super fine particles that clog up the lungs of, of, a, of an insect. So lung, uh, insects breathe through their skin. It, there's no chemicals, nothing that can hurt you. Um, so it's, so th th I'll put that down for squash bugs. And, and even then, it doesn't necessarily always make a difference because it only impacts the nymphs. So for squash bugs, you really just got to pay attention. Um, there's, a, there's other things you can do, too. Um, like you can put netting over the plant um, to help for a while, but you have to have insects to pollinate squash. So you've got to have, you got to open it up once they start making flowers. So um, really the key to squash is to try and plant in a lot of different places. Another thing I will say about squash bugs too, if you grow squash vertically, it's a lot easier to manage them. So a, a zucchini plant, uh, we'll put a T post in the ground right next to the squash plant. And then as it grows, I'll, I'll tie it to that T post and grow it straight up in the air. And this does a couple of things. Number one, it makes it easier for you to see squash bugs. Also makes it a lot easier for insects like praying mantises and birds to see squash bugs and hunt them for you. So that's one thing you can do. You can also find varieties of squash um, from Japan. We have a blog post about this that are more resistant to some of these pests, specifically the squash vine borer. Let me go in detail about that pest a little bit. So this is a squash vine borer here. It looks kind of like a wasp while it's in the air, but it's not. It can't sting you or anything. It tries to act like it can, but it, it doesn't. Um, and it lays its egg at the, at the base of the plant, and then its egg tunnels into the plant, makes this little, well, technically they lay their eggs inside the plant, then it, point is there's a caterpillar inside your plant that looks like this, that eats it from the inside. Um, so that's, that can only happen on a squash plant that has a, a hollow stem. Well, there are squash varieties from Japan that have solid stems. So there's ways you can, you can manage these pests just by being smarter about what varieties you grow. Uh, we've got about 15 minutes left, so anyone have any specific things you want to hear about before I just kind of keep going down the list? All right, let's talk about cilantro. So I love cilantro. I know some people don't like the taste of it, um, but I love it. And it's very difficult to grow in Oklahoma because it does not like the heat. So as soon as it starts to get too hot, cilantro will, will bolt. And what that means is it sends up a, a middle stalk that goes high in the air, all the leaves turn bitter and, and really non-edible, and then they produce seeds, right? So lettuce, spinach, kale, they all do the same, or kale doesn't necessarily, but they all do the, this, the same thing. Um, and uh, so, so it's kind of difficult to grow cilantro once you get into the summer, but there are other plants that taste just like cilantro that you can switch to. So if you search for cilantro in the app, it'll pull both of them up, and we have, um, so the, the, the Vietnamese cilantro, and I guess we don't have the Puerto Rican in there yet, that's coming soon, but the Vietnamese cilantro is a great alternative you can switch to in the summer that tastes just like cilantro. It's not in the cilantro family, but it just it mimics the taste. And there's a Puerto Rican cilantro as well that, that also, it, it likes the shade, it doesn't like the heat, it doesn't like the sun, but it can tolerate the heat. So those are two things that, that we switch to in the summer whenever, whenever we don't have cilantro. Um, okay, so I think, Really the last few things we have time to talk about here are tomatoes and peppers. So we talked about starting tomatoes inside. Let's talk about how we actually grow tomatoes. So um, there's two different main types of tomatoes. There are bush tomatoes, which grow like three to four feet tall and then stop, stop growing and then make a bunch of tomatoes at once. 
Those are really handy for if you're wanting to can or make a bunch of salsa or something like that. Those are, those are really nice. Um, there's other varieties of tomatoes that vine, that continue to produce vines until it freezes. Uh, typically, your cherry tomatoes are like that. Um, those are, are nice to grow because they continue to put out fruit kind of all seasons. So you got two different types of tomatoes to choose from. The easiest tomatoes to grow in Oklahoma are the smaller ones. And really that's the way for any fruit. The smaller the fruit, the easier it is gonna to be to grow. The cherries are unbelievably easy to grow. They're so easy to grow. Um, some of the bigger ones that take like 20 days for the tomato to mature once it sets, those can be challenging sometimes because if you get a bunch of rain one day that comes in, well that can produce blossom end rot because it washes all the calcium out of it. And there's, you know, so there's different challenges that come up, especially in Oklahoma, how fickle our weather is. Um, that makes it difficult sometimes to grow those larger tomatoes. So if you have a greenhouse or something like that, it's, it's way easier to grow the bigger tomatoes. But outdoors, I'm, I'm pretty much sticking to cherry tomatoes. I'll do Roma tomato. I do a lot of determinate, like the bush tomatoes. I really like growing those. I'll grow those in waves, so I have them producing at different times. Um, and then like I mentioned earlier, tomatoes are going to drop flowers in the summer. So don't expect to get much once it's July. Yes? I have a question about seed starting. Seed starting, yeah. yeah. So seed starting, that's a great question. If, if I'm starting peppers, sometimes I'll use a warming tray. The, the room that I have all my seed starting stuff in is my office where my computer is. And then I, with the lights and everything, it's already pretty warm in there. Um, so I, I really don't have to worry about that, but especially if you're doing a windowsill. If you're starting seeds on a windowsill, you pretty much have to have a tray underneath of it um, if you're doing peppers or tomatoes. But really, I wouldn't recommend a windowsill. You just don't get enough light. Um, so for my indoor stuff where I just have the big like seed starting station, by the way, on our, on our YouTube channel and website, we have a guide for how to do a seed starting station kind of DIY where we just took like a five shelf rack and then got lights off of Craigslist really cheap uh, and then hung them from each shelf. And that's how we start our seeds. So, um, so that's basically the, 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 the short answer on, on seed starting on that. Um, let me go into detail and see starting a little bit. Uh, I, th I think I'm pretty much covered. Let me let's talk about the lights, because that was probably the biggest confusion I had when I started. If you want to do seed starting, you see a lot of information out there, but like, we have to have this color light or this color light and all that kind of stuff. That does not matter if you're starting seeds. The color of the light only really comes into play if you're trying to grow the plant to like full size or if it's a full size plant. That's when you need all these different spectrums and stuff. If you're just starting seeds, just get the regular white, like. 4,500 color shop light, you know, standard white. Just get that. That's all you need. They're super cheap. Um, I talked about the mix I used for seed starting earlier, just that compressed uh, coconut core. So um, we got 10 minutes left. It's probably time to start giving out some smart pots. So uh, if you don't have a ticket, last chance, raise your hand back there. Okay, I've got a few tickets hand out. And let me get these in there. And uh, let's. I almost made it squeaky, y'all. Does anyone have any other questions before we do this? Anything you want to know more about? Yes? So, can we have your app and do an update? How do we get the update? The update should automatically come down from the App Store. So, uh, that should automatically be managed. Now, if you do want to try out the Garden Plus stuff that we talked about that lets you log and all of that, just send us an email at info at cdespoon.net or there's a way to email us through the app. Um, we've got cards around here somewhere. Uh, Patrick, I think, has cards on them um, if you want information about the app. Or you just search for gardening in the App Store. You can find it that way as well. Um, okay, let's go ahead and start drawing here. So the first winner, 284. All right. These are five gallon smart pots, by the way. Um, I've grown tomatoes in these even. So it's a little difficult, but you can grow even a, even a tomato in these. These are a great size, though, for an individual herb, like oregano or rosemary. Like any of those are going to do great in here. Yes. When you harvest those greens, do you cut them off or do you pull them up by the roots? Great question. So when we harvest greens, it's important just to so if it's lettuce, we're cutting the entire plant, uh, just like an inch above the above the base, right? And then it will regrow sometimes three times. With spinach. We're harvesting like three leaves off each plant. And with kale, we're doing the same. So we're not like pulling the entire plant up or anything like that, because it'll continue to produce. A lot of these plants are called what's called cut and come again, where you can cut it and it grows back again. So lettuce, spinach, they're all like that. So really the thing you're fighting with those plants is the heat. You're doing that as much as you can until it gets too hot, then they bolt. 
So in the summer, you got to switch. If you want to have greens in the summer, you have to switch to some other stuff. So there's Malabar spinach, which does well in the heat. Again, not in the spinach family. It's just called Malabar spinach. Tastes kind of like it. Um, sweet potato greens, also, uh, you can eat those. Um, and then New Zealand spinach. Uh, again, not in the spinach family. Just has the name. Those are three things we switch to in the summer for greens. Okay, next winner is 250. We got one? Awesome. Next one is 315. The last three digits, 315. Okay. 312. All right. 275. I got some too. 268. There you go. 265, awesome, 294, 300, awesome, we got a winner, 269, 249, 313, here, can I toss it back, oh, he's got one, okay. Um, how many we got left? So we got put in. 259. <laughs> 280. All right, over here. 260. 255. Right here, Patrick. Keeping in one spot. 274. Back behind you. Is that your last one? Okay, I got one more. 248. Oh, wow. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we are doing, so at uh, 2 o'clock, pretty much right now, at our booth right under 4200 over there, we're going to go in detail on herbs. So oregano, rosemary, sage, chives. We're going to go in detail on how to grow it, how to cook with it, all sorts of stuff. So thank you, everyone, and hopefully you join us over there.